For copyright reasons, the producers of Taking You For Granted would like to state that this podcast is in no way associated with the actor Hugh John Mungo Grant, nor does it endorse his views or represent him in any way. We simply review Mr Grant's films and hope to shine light upon some of the lesser-known classics from his illustrious career. Hugh, if you're listening, we hope you approve. Listen, I did film and television studies at university for three years. I spent hours reading countless books and articles on subjects spanning from film all the way to television. Not a single one mentioned Hugh Grant once. I achieved the hardest qualification across any university or college ever, a 2-1 in history. Let me tell you, the only thing that I learned was that we, as a society, have a history of denying and neglecting Hugh Grant's artistic and cultural relevance, not just in this country, but in the entire world. I met Oscar at a Hugh Grant-themed event I put on at the Students' Union. It felt as though Diggory and I were the only ones there. And we agreed that there was a Hugh Grant-shaped hole in academia. We decided to put it right ourselves. We want to show people that he's an icon in acting. We want to show people he's more than just a bumbling posh guy. I'm Diggory Waite. And I'm Oscar Beardmore Gray. And And this this is... Take it, Hugh, for granted. Hi there, you're listening to Taking Hugh for Granted with Diggory Waite and Oscar Beardmore Gray, the podcast in which two friends watch every single film starring Hugh Grant and ask the simple question, is this film taking Hugh for granted? Is this film good on its own or does it rely on the bumbling Brit for its acclaim? This week we start with Grant's third masterpiece, White Mischief, where Grant dips into colonial life in Kenya during the Second World War. There's murder, drugs, sex and general bad behaviour. Enough about your Monday morning, Diggs. Uh, Where to start? (laughs) Well, uh, I suppose for the listeners who haven't seen it, and I guess that's most of them, let's have a synopsis of the film from a very special guest. White Mischief, directed by Michael Radford and released in 1987. Hugh, played by Hugh Grant, tries to convince a young woman not to marry a millionaire past his prime. As Hugh is unsuccessful in his attempts, Jock Broughton and his new young trophy wife Diana travel to Kenya circa 1940 to find other affluent British expatriates living large, swapping partners, doing drugs and attending lavish parties and horse races. Diana soon begins a torrid affair with Jocelyn Hay, played by Charles Dance, and seemingly ends her marriage amicably, if prematurely. One night, however, Jocelyn is murdered, and all evidence points to Diana's ex-husband, Jock. (laughs) What a fantastic voice. So, uh, the film opens with two men talking about moving to Kenya, and then Hugh Grant rides in on a horse. Oscar, what did you think of the first time you saw Hugh Grant in this film? Uh, Well, I mean, it's it's short and brief, it's got to be said, but... I mean, he's got cur- he's got the curtains going yeah. again. Yeah. Good for him. Uh, and he, you know, he gets on with it. He gets a kiss off the main act off the main actress straight away. Yeah, yeah. Fair play to the with fair play to the lad. It's hot shit. It's really hot shit. And she's grabbing his the back of his head really hard. She wants that kiss. <laughs> she's loving it. But but I have to say, compared to his. Compared to how he looked in Maurice, I must say I don't think he looks as dashing. I think this is this is Grant unkempt. This is Grant even like a bit haggard. Um, he's this still... is this is World War this is World War Two Grant. Exactly. Maybe he's a bit stressed. The girl that he fancies is, is going to marry some old man for his money, and she's going to move to Kenya. He's pro- and he's probably like he hasn't got the rations for his hair gel. Probably. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And they. they... Uh, although they did have enough for some, what what were they drinking? Cause it, so they're sort of celebrating, quote unquote, her marriage to this old man, which both of them I don't think are very convinced by. And they're drinking some. They're know, drinking moe. Oh my goodness! So moe enough, champagne. Enough for that. Yeah, exactly. He's he's clearly got it. There's enough to go around, isn't it? Yeah, it's terrible. It's dreadful. But he is delightfully Hugh Grant. He's ju- he again. He's just so posh and bumbling. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> 
Okay, just as a precursor to our audience, Hugh Grant literally has about five lines in this entire uh, film. Oscar, I've counted. By my calculation, he has eight lines in the film. <laughs> <laughs> but they all come at the beginning, so they, you're kind of like, oh, Hugh, Hugh Grant's going to be the main act. Yeah, legit. My, It's Hugh Grant. He was, third, he was the 12th name on the billing at the beginning, um, <laughs> and he was on screen for one minute and 27 seconds, by my calculation. <laughs> so if you're looking for a classic Hugh, Hugh Grant film, this is the one to go for because it's wrapped up nice and quick. You get you, yeah, you get it, out. Like it's fine. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. You literally have to be there for a minute and a half. Yeah. But the, I mean, okay. So he has eight lines. My yeah. obviously my favorite of them is she says something like, "Oh, all the tigers in Africa," and he's like, "Ostriches, baboons, hyenas, hyenas." And the way he says hyenas, he's like hyenas, hyenas. Yeah. No tigers in Africa. Aren't they? What are they then? Um, ostriches, baboons, hyenas. Well, here's to all of them. And respectability. It's, it's, yeah, New tigers in Africa. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, mate, it's it's so great. I think, uh, I mean, I've, I've actually written down all of his lines. We can go through them one by one if need be. Oh, yeah, um, we should go through them one by I one. I think we definitely. should go through them one by one. So the film opens and... The guy talking about, he says, he's riding on his horse and he says to the man who's marrying this girl that he's with, he says, morning, sir. Sorry about your lawn. And then it cuts to the title. So we don't know what happened to the lawn. We don't know what the problem was with the lawn. Hugh Grant's first line in this film is completely pointless. Morning, Jock. How was the ride? Oh, it was marvellous. Morning, sir. Ah. Very sorry about your lawn. Oh, don't worry. I have to say, you know, obviously, as you do, you're doing you're doing thorough research into this film. And, mm. you know, I, I wrote down the line and was thinking, OK, you know, when's this going to circle back to the lawn? And it mm. never circles back. It never circles back. And I, to be honest, I think that's a big issue with the film for me it's a huge <laughs> issue with the film i think we the, you know the film was a mystery and the whole time i wasn't thinking oh who killed blah blah i thought what happened to the lawn what was wrong with the lawn we never find out i know not yeah. to spoil it for everyone but it's kind of rubbish so so lawn gate continues um <laughs> lawn gate then we skip so then after the titles then they give they they like go well he goes well he has to love <laughs> very funny You don't think he's rather old? I like older men. They have more money. My mother married for a title, and look what happened to her. I'm not your mother, thank God. Well, it closes most of your options, that's all. So what do we think, then, if we're going to extrapolate as much as we can... What do we think about his character? What's his backstory? What What's his relationship to the main woman? That is a very good question. Um, if I was to guess, I would say that he, of course, is a an upper class gentleman mm-hmm. who who doesn't who for some reason isn't fighting in the war. So well, that's mm. a bit strange. So maybe he's copped out and he's in the he's in the home guard or something. But mm. he's drinking champagne, so that's a bit weird. Mm. Um, I would say his relationship is probably a sort of part-time lover of uh, of our lady Diana Broughton, or whatever Ooh, her name is. Yeah, I know. What, what, what do you think? You know, I think you're absolutely right. I think he's a fool. I think he's clearly just like this side chick or this side piece, not knowing, you know, that he clearly fancies her. Well, the line where she says, tell me you love me. And he says, well, I love you. You know I do. <laughs> um, he, he clearly he's clearly infatuated with her but she is so materialistic that she's gonna go and marry this old man for his money and uh, in, in Kenya um, but he sort of goes well, along with ke- it Kenya yeah. they say. isn't that amazing they all pronounce it <laughs> Kenya Kenya um, so yeah so I think that he plays a posh fool who is so in love and infatuated with this person that he's gonna let them go off and do their thing and just leave him behind. I mean, I, I wish that Hugh... I was waiting for Hugh to come to Kenya yes. at some part of the film. I was like, when, when is he going to turn up to save the day and I, like sweep this, sweep this woman off her feet? Oh, uh, mate, I thought he was the fucking murderer. I thought we were going to get to <laughs> I thought surely it's Stop giving you. the game away oh, for the film. Oh, shit. Sorry, mate. Sorry. I thought that he was the one. But clearly he was too busy at home fucking about with a lawn 
Um, yeah, is, well, exactly. You were, well, you were expecting him to sort of turn up in the house, sort of blood over, all over his hands and a shotgun going, oh, I'm so dreadfully sorry that I've shot your boyfriend. <laughs> I, I, I must have slipped. It was the lawn. Um, hadn't been cut very well. And unfortunately, here we are. Uh, yeah. It's all those baboons, uh, hyenas and ostriches. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Um, yeah. What's he wearing? He's wearing he... a, at least when the, he's wearing a black, actually quite similar, I think, to what he was wearing in, in Maurice. He's wearing a black suit with a white shirt uh, with the top button undone. So maybe he's been to some like nice fancy dinner or something. Um, mm. And then, I'm, yeah. I'm glad that he he's lost the moustache in this film. And the yeah. moustache is not a good look. No, it doesn't suit Hugh. It's similar to me. I think any facial hair on me would look dreadful. And I think it's similar for Hugh. I think he doesn't suit. It. Well, who, who would who would who would wear it better, Diggory or Hugh? That I think. <laughs> let's get that trending. <laughs> in the year 2020, at the dawn of a new decade. Two men go hair to hair on who has the best facial hair. Hashtag who wore it better, Hugh or Diggory? And the winner is... Hugh Grant. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here reporting live from downtown New York for Taking You For Granted, and I'm pleased to inform you of a momentous moment in world cinema. Hugh Grant has proved his doubters wrong yet again and has beaten Diggory Waite in the Who Wore It Better campaign. The public have seen through Diggory's pathetic slug moustache and crowned Hugh Champion. I've got Hugh with me here now. Hugh, what do you make of this latest honour? Well, uh... Well, thank you, Hugh, for those truly moving words. This was taking you for granted live from the Big Apple. See you next time. I guess we should talk briefly about the fact that this is, as far as I'm, as I'm aware, this is the only film that Hugh Grant plays a character called Hugh. Well, I think you might be right. We might have to do another deep dive on his IMDb page to make sure that's absolutely correct. But yeah, uh, yeah, it probably is, which kind of works. And what's funny is he's obviously credited in his first film, Privileged, as Huey Grant. And That's in true. Yeah. this, she calls him Huey. And I, so I was like, ooh, a bit of a callback there for the fans. If you're, if you're, I mean, you probably know better than I do on this kind of thing, but if you're a very minor part in some kind of film like this do you mm. do you get any say on your name like has he said i want to be called hugh for this film or is it just co- complete coincidence that he's been casted as a guy called hugh when he's called hugh i have no idea the only time i've heard about that being um that happening is actually the opposite for huge actors i apparently will smith for the fresh prince of bel-air was like oh what what name am i gonna have and they were like you should be called will he's like what it's like your character's name should be Will Smith because this is going to be such a big show. You will be known as Will forevermore. You want it to be your real name, be Will in the in the thing. So that is the only that's the only knowledge I have of that. So I have no idea if he chose it. But sometimes it's probably just easier. Like Hugh Grant is a footnote on my ass in this film. He's he like they were going to forget his name during that during the one minute thirty seconds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> They only say it once. They say, it, I think it's Huey. They say it Huey. So it's not even as he's credited in the film. So yeah, there you go. Um, I, I wonder, so so far, thinking over all the Hugh Grant films that I've watched um, and not wanting to give anything away about further episodes, but I think there's a good chance that Hugh Grant will appear with a huge country house in almost every film that he's in i want to bet that there's going to be a big country house in pretty much every film that he's in do you know what that's a great thing maybe that's what what we need to do as well we need to make like a a drinking game um and like a checklist that we can do that'll be fun uh every time yeah every time you see a country house drink every every time he says well yeah or um (laughs) or uh or, or he, every time he plays, every time he plays with his hair. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's a great one. I watched a clip from About a Boy, and and it's sort of similar to this film because when she says, "Tell me, I love you. Tell me, Huey. Tell me you love me," and he goes, he, he does this thing with his eyes where he looks incredulous, and then says, "Well, uh, 
I love you. You know I do. <laughs> so I think any of that closing your eyes and sort of thinking before you speak, it's a hard one. It's a niche one. But if you get what I mean, you'll know it straight away. Mm. It's just so Hugh Grant. The, um, the hardcore fans will appreciate that one. Big time. Maybe that's what we should do. If we ever like open up a Patreon or whatever, we should be like, if we get 500 people to give us a dollar or whatever, we can... We can do a nice live stream of us watching some of his old films and getting absolutely crunk. Um, that'd mm. be good fun. Yeah, if we were doing the drinking game. We need, to, we, we need to think of, maybe we'll think about it, a rule where you down your drink. Yeah. There must be some something where you, you, you know. To be honest, I, I think it's got to be the country home. That could get you seriously sloshed. <laughs> that could get you seriously sloshed because there's probably a lot of films where there's multiple country homes. Exactly. Are you a business owner? Are you running a political campaign? Are you a furniture outlet having yet another sale? If the answer to any of those questions isn't no, then you can have your advertisement right here. The Taking You For Granted podcast gets over a hand listeners every single episode. For prices starting as low as six figures, you can have your advertisement right here. So what are you waiting for? <laughs> Email takingyouforgranted at gmail.com today for a full price list and you can have your advertisement right here. Is it is an interesting part of British like British history as well? Reading up about it, so apparently there's this 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 group of people that still to some extent exist now mm-hmm. who are known as the Happy Valley Set, the, the Happy Valley Set. So these are yeah. these are people who, well, they're they're British colonialists who have basically uh, fucked off to Kenya because I don't know they're Why poor not? in England or they're mm-hmm. like, well, why don't we go and fuck around in the colonies for a bit mm. um and then you know it became a sort of place for um it was known for its orgies its its drugs its drinking mm. um just general bad behavior mm. and this this murder happened here where earl of errol joss mm. uh joss hay was 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 killed by by this older this older fellow mm. um jock and it, it remains an unsolved mystery who mm. actually killed him so we're actually what I'm, I'm speculating the film suggests it was jock mm. but. and i think everything seems to point to it being him he has all the motive um because as we say his young trophy wife and charles dancer's character are getting it out and everyone knows about it but the thing is charles dancer's character is known for the orgies that he puts on. That's like basically what he's known for. And that was in real life as well. He was basically known because he put on fantastic orgies. So everyone's banging everyone out there. Diana, I want you to meet one of the most amusing men in Africa, Joss Hell. How do you do? Welcome to paradise. May I take your photograph? Well, of course, but whatever for. Jock insists I photograph anything that takes my fancy. It's what I found as well is uh, at least we not to spoil future episodes, but when I was doing research on this, when I first was developing the idea of taking you for granted back in two thousand and four, I watched, uh, I watched um, the day you watched Love Actually. <laughs> yeah, I was like, time. oh, this is amazing. Um, I was watching a film called Bitter Moon, which is coming up in a few, like maybe you know, in, in the teeny episodes. Um, that is very sex heavy as well, and I think a lot up, right now what I can tell is. Hugh Grant's early work, there's a lot of sex and a lot of it's a lot of romance films as well, uh, and a lot of yeah, mm-hmm. a lot of relationships and things like that. So we, we're in for an interesting one because this film starts basically after this. A lady is you know has, she got her kit off, she's in the bath and she's blowing a flower and wherever it lands, she bangs that person because there's all these men just sat around the bath she's in. That's the yeah. kind of vibe we're at. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of naked women in this film. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 a, and a lot of a, a, enough naked Charles dance that I'm happy. Any less, and I would have been upset because <laughs> there was a bit where we saw his pubes, and I was like, okay, good, that's fine. I was happy with that because yeah, I'm there's sorry, a bit. There's a he's so fit. Yeah, a, yeah he's looking pretty good because, yeah. like, you know, I have to say I've only watched probably Charles dance in the 2000s, 2010, mm. and now he's a sort of cranky old man with white hair, but. Yeah. Back in the day, the man the man was a good looking fella. Serious swagger. And 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 as as we're told in the film, which is kind of a bit of a weird like it's so colonial, that Charles Dance has apparently rogered every girl in the colony. Talking of big game. There's one of the biggest in the colony. 
Isn't he splendid? Who is he? Joss Errol. Lord Errol. Fourth in line to the throne of Scotland. No money at all. Oh? Confidentially, he's a frightened cad. Divorced heaven knows how many times. Rogered every girl in the colony. Practically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, which is just... He's one of the most amusing men in Africa, apparently. <laughs> yeah, indeed. In all of Kenya. Oh, it's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, instead of like being like, oh, he's fucked around, it's like, yeah, he's rogered everyone, which I, I do love. Do you, that was great. Do you think... I? So this is something I thought. Do you think Charles Dance in this film looks a bit like Prince Charles? Yeah. Yeah, I can definitely see that. He looks like Prince And Charles. his wife is called... And the person he wants to sleep with is called Diana. Weird. Yeah, exactly. No, I think you're right. Yeah, exactly. No, I think you're right, Oscar. Yeah, so what did you think about this, about the proceedings then? Is there is there any other... So obviously I've talked about Charles Dance for me is, in this film is just so sick. He looks really... Like, he's a bit of a dick, the character, for sure. Cause, like, he, <laughs> he's a massive dick. Yeah. He's like the equivalent of like... A hockey boy at uni. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's the he's the big cheese on campus, and then he sees this woman who's married to his mate, and he goes up to her and goes, "Can I steal her for a dance?" And his the guy's like, "Yeah, all right, go on then." And then they're dancing. He's like, "I want to take you home and have sex with you," and she's obviously outraged. <laughs> she's obviously what? What are you doing? I'm married. I mean, obviously it works eventually, but yeah. And so he is a dick, but he's really fit and he's really suave. Yeah. Yeah, and clearly every girl in the colony is falling for him like a fucking deck of cards. Yeah, exactly. It's outrageous. They're all swooning like crazy. Let's skip to the murder. Let's get to the juicy bit. So, oh, well, let, let's talk, because actually it is a murder mystery. It's quite cool. So uh, the man who is dating Diana, it gets really drunk and has to be taken home. And also, his gun has gone missing earlier that day, and he's filed for He's, like, told everyone it's gone missing. Then, and he said to Diana, please come home by dawn. And he said to Charles Dance, bring my wife home by dawn. You know, have your fun, have your affair, but bring her home by dawn. At dawn, he brings her home. He's driving home alone. And someone stops his car. They poke their... He, like, rolls down the window. The man pokes his head in and basically shoots him. Uh, and that's how the murder is done. What do we think about that um i th- i i think you see his face a tiny bit don't you oh i didn't i don't know i don't think i saw well, that maybe i maybe mean the, you don't the frame of the attacker is definitely a similar frame to the oh there's some dogs barking the frame of the attacker is definitely similar to the frame of the of diana's of husband. Jock. yeah jock yeah well, I mean, it's left out open-ended, really, because you never see him quite fall asleep. You're, you mm. you see him kind of in his bed, really fucking drunk, and he starts crying. And you, mm. I, I have to say, at that moment, I was like, oh, my God, poor bloke. Yeah, honestly, yeah. And then, and then suddenly, the next moment, he's he's got a bloody killed someone. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, I don't feel so sorry for him now. Yeah, exactly. But what, what it looks like to me is it's this, like, really well-thought-out premeditated murder where in the morning he goes, oh, my gun's missing. I'm going to I'm gonna file it. As he tells everyone, says, oh, my gun's gone. I'm going to ring up and say, well, my gun's gone missing. Then that evening, mm. gets really drunk. But then when, when the woman that's helping him home closes the door, he stops crying and he stops laughing and, like, falling over everywhere and then just looks straight forward like he wasn't drunk at all. Did you, Ooh, did you take that I didn't that notice well? that. But like, I is, didn't am notice I not right? that. Is that not what No, happened? you are yeah. right. You and, are right. And then... And then, and then obviously, he, he, builds a, he builds a bonfire the next day. That wasn't very subtle. Yeah, exactly. So all of these things work out really well. That, and also, he's asked um, our boy Charles Dance to bring Diana home at dawn, which means that he will be driving home in the middle of the night on his own, and it's really dark. Mm. And then he takes that, that gun, the weapon... Kills him with it and then burns it the next day in the bonfire. One bit that did make me laugh a lot yes. was that when he's when he's standing trial and he's being cross examined, the the judge asks him, like, you know, why did you burn stuff the next day? And he's like, well, I was just having a bonfire, you know, as you do. I like bonfires. So it's like that is not an excuse. <laughs> That's terrible. In a in a murder case yeah. when you're the prime suspect. May I ask why you decided to light a bonfire in this particular occasion? It needed to be done. 
I was very much distressed by the news of Lord Errol's death. I thought it might cheer me up. I've always loved a bonfire. They just let that fly, that he was just burning... He could have been burning anything mm. the na- next morning. Yeah. And for some reason, he claims he likes bonfires, so that's okay. Yeah. It, yeah, that... Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it, was, it, was sim- it was similar to Risley's trial, the... The in, yes. in Maurice, where basically you have a posh gentleman and they get off scot free because because no one wants to no one wants to put them down for murder. Yeah, I think in, for that one they said, well, b- b- considering your social standing, we shall only give you five months of community service. Yeah, so now it's like, <laughs> well, no, jolly good. Yeah, well, fantastic. We're home for lunch. Um, yeah, is that time for tea? Is the cricket still on? Yeah, all that. Um, what I liked as well is the morgue. When people went to go and see Charles Dance's dead body, are we going to speak about what that woman? Oh did? my god, that was so rogue! It was the most rogue thing. That was completely unnecessary. It was so weird. No, Sabu, please. No, you're mine forever, Charles. Not possible, Miss Sabu. It was so weird. So all you got to you got to explain it. All these women, because he he slept with a lot of women and he's broken a lot of hearts. This guy Charles Dance, understandably so. He's broken my heart by dying as well. And I only saw him in the film for like forty minutes. So they all turn up and they're all crying in their own little ways and they they see his dead body. And this one woman walks up to him, puts her hand down her like up her skirt, starts, um, you know, playing with herself, <laughs> and then. Takes her hand out and smears, <laughs> smears, smears, yeah, wipes whatever is on there over his mouth, saying over his over his dead body on his mouth, saying, I, you know, now you're always mine, or now we're always together. Uh, <laughs> and then the man who's waiting there in the morgue is, is being like, no, this is impossible, no, stop, please. <laughs> it was just really, and I was like, yeah, mate, get her to stop. This is so weird. And the other women just watch on, like they're like feel your sister yeah you won you got him <laughs> your lovely juice is all over his face you got him baby yeah I mean, that, that was... must be one of the most bizarre and disrespectful things to do it to to do to, to a, a dead, dead body. body yeah she, yeah I, she ended up killing herself for some bizarre reason in the film i didn't really understand and i was sort of like well at least you'll be with the man that you smeared pussy on his face yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, cut that bit out. Look over there, Hugh Grant's in a prep. Look over there, he's holding a baguette. Other than that, I, I suppose afterwards, yeah, we had the trial. I mean, th- he had a really good defence. That is the problem, and if that was real life. So his defence lawyer said, um, talked about his time when he was in the army. I'm guessing he was in World War One, And he was saying that... The Irish guards. There we go. He got sunstroke. And he messed up his arm a bit. He had a gammy leg. And also he was like diagnosed with like night blindness or something. Basically, yeah. So he had really couldn't really see in, in the dark. So the idea that he would do this murder was, you know, unthinkable. Then as well, speaking more socially and culturally at the time, one of the lines is quite poor, quite telling when someone says, "You, it, it, it's Kenya in World War Two. They're not going to uh, charge a, an Englishman. In Kenya, a white a white Englishman, they were like, you, mm. you know, that's just not going to happen in 1940s Kenya. And you're like, well, shit. So, I mean, I guess we should move on to the fact that Jock, yeah. after this, becomes a little bit, like, obsessive with Diana. So mm. that that's uh, his his actual wife, who yeah. clearly doesn't want to be with him anymore. Yeah. And then he kind of goes a bit crazy. Yeah. Uh, and Diana tries to leave, and he gets out his shotgun. And it's basically like you cannot leave and like starts chasing her around yeah. the house and then it, i guess it was a little bit telegraphed she's uh, she's back in a corner he pulls the shotgun and basically blows his brains out yeah. you have to feel a bit sorry for diana she's seen bo- both her husband and her lover yeah killed in the space of well 30 minutes in the film i don't know how long it yeah. is in real life <laughs> yeah yeah it interestingly so obviously this suicide was done for dramatic effect in the film. In yeah. real life, Jock, the cat, Jock mm. in real life, actually he returned. He returned to England, mm. but he actually did commit suicide through a morphine overdose. Yeah, yeah. So, it's about a year later as well, and they divorced by that point. IRL, mm. but in, obviously in the film, like you say, for dramatic effect, it was 
it was quite useful to have the shotgun there and have it turn him on himself. But like you say, poor Diana that like, yeah, she she also sees him like blow half of his head off and her, and, and her lover has been shot mercilessly probably by him as well. And don't forget, I'm also just a girl standing in front of a boy asking him to love her. You know, that's the end of the film. What did you think of the film as a whole? I'm comparing it to Maurice. Mm. Yeah, I, I again, I enjoyed it. And yeah. the bit I enjoyed the most was the first minute and a half of the yeah. film. So Yeah, it's, a, it's surprising. That's exactly what I was going to say. The first minute and a half was 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 un- unbeatable. That was class. Um, but yeah, like you say, so comparing it to Maurice, exactly. That film, I will take a lot more away from Maurice. But I probably found, like you say, this one was much more like bubblegum. Just chucked it in my mouth, watched it, and I was like, great. And like, it was maybe more, maybe more entertaining, maybe. But I'll definitely, I've already taken away so much from Maurice that, Mm. you know. Well, I guess we we didn't get as much of Hugh in this film. So that you have to, you you have to take it down a notch. But then again, if you're going to. You know, you've got the two DVDs in your hand, and it's uh, and it, you know, it's 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 a it's a cold night in December, and yeah. you got the you got the fire on, and you know, you you're on a date or something. You're like, which one am I going to stick on, Maurice <laughs> or White Mischief? <laughs> you're you're going to choose White Mischief, aren't yeah, you? Exactly. I think that would be a bit weird if you put on Maurice and then you've got like Hugh Grant and with a moustache, kind of yeah, two hours shit. of that. Jeez. Um, I, I do like this weird world in which you have two DVDs. One is Maurice, 1987. The other one yeah, is uh, is White Mischief. Um, fantastic stuff. Well, yeah, I'm standing by with the DVD. As, as, uh, I'm standing by with a DVD. I mean, we can't finish with play that. It, <laughs> play it, Bob. <laughs> Imagine if Hugh Grant was in Johnny English. I was that would just that make the film. He would fit it really well. He'd really fit yeah. that universe. He- he could, I mean, he, could be, he could be a villain in, in like the third or fourth one if they ever going to do a fourth one. Because there's a third one, mm. right? There is a third one. God. I've heard it's not very good. Yeah, though. I'm not surprised at all. Taking he for granted. Taking he for granted. Taking he for granted. What did you think, lads? Were they taking he for granted? Is this film taking he for granted? Well, I'd say the film crew and the producers of the actual film have taken Hugh for granted a lot Big by time. by not giving him more airtime. I don't know if there's a deleted scene or something that we could find with, <laughs> that they they just basically you know Hugh, Hugh's been promised like you know 15 minutes of airtime and he and he and he and he's sitting there in the cinema for the first time and he, and you know he, he's watching a minute and a half and then he's gone. Mm. Um, so in that respect, I say he's he's been taken for granted here, mm. but. I think the true hardcore fans will recognise that you really got some some early day classic Hugh Grant style monologue and um, his quote with the baboons yeah. is you know if I think if you're if you're putting together a select reel of mm. of, of Hugh Grant's greatest lines yeah. that's that, that's a candidate for, for 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 so far you'd definitely have that in the in the very shortlist um, ostriches baboons. Hyenas. Well, here's to all of them. Mate, we've got to do that. Let's make we'll make, let's make a shortlist. Let's make a, a best quotes, best lines thing. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, I can't think of a better way to sum that up. You're absolutely right. The the producers have taken Hugh for granted, but the film itself and and the real fans will know this this film is is good. Yeah, you smashed it. I can't. I'm trying to put it in better words than, than you, and I can't. Um, so yeah what do you think this film would have been like maybe a little epilogue question if Charles Dance had been Charles Dance character had actually been played by Hugh Grant how different would the film have been (laughs) well it's interesting you ask that because I read up that actually Richard Attenborough was offered the role and turned it down wow Um, but if Hugh was to play this character Mm. Well, I don't think Hugh is as Hugh, Hugh just wouldn't have been as good because no. he's not he's not as sleazy as Charles Dance. Yeah. Or, or or like anywhere near as sinister. Exactly. Yeah. Hugh wouldn't have had the balls to go up to Diana and be like, "I want to sleep with you." He would have been like, "Oh, I want um, to make love with you." Yeah, he's like, "Oh, uh, <coughs> I um, I really would like to make love to you later." <laughs> is that all right? <laughs> 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 it would have, um, yeah. 
So I think you know, as much as we would have loved to see Hugh in this role, I think mm. I think they went with the right the right character. Yeah, I agree. And I, although I would have loved to see Hugh um, walking through the ocean naked, um, that would have been fantastic. That would have been great. Yeah, that would have been good. And I also would have liked to have seen Hugh get um, a lady's private parts smeared all over his face, his dead face. <laughs> 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 that would have just been the absolute that would have been great. All right, everyone. All right, yeah, it's me again. Uh, just wanted to say that we're on Twitter and Instagram. Right, on Instagram we're at taking you for granted. Right, and then on Twitter we're at taking you apparently there's too many characters for at taking you for granted so we're at taking you on twitter yeah at huh oh right and or if you want to email us as well we're taking you for granted at gmail.com yeah so if you could email us there as well right i've got to go now and wipe the spit off my chin so see you later